Today's Bible bridge from Genesis chapter 13, verse 14 to 17. The Lord said to Abraham, after Lot has separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward, and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see I will give to you, and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if no one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. We've uh, been on this, for the past few weeks, we've been on this series on adventures of faith. And um, I've been very encouraged, because um, before we stand to preach, any of us, we, we've be, been in the world and been in God's praise, and I, first of all, minister to before we could minister. And I've been very encouraged by what God is saying. And then I feel energized more. And a, a sense of God saying, this is what we've called you to do. And uh, what he's called us to do, we cannot just meander ourselves into it. We have to be intentional about it. We have to walk by faith. It, it, it requires only faith to do what God has called us to do. And I'm going to tell you, if God has ever given you a dream or a vision, if you don't require faith to do it, it's not from God. If God has a purpose for your life, if there's a dream he's given to you, you're going to need faith for that to come to pass. So when we're talking about adventures of faith, when we're talking about Peniel, we're talking about your life to be an adventure with God. And so I'm going to pray as we get into uh, an installment for today. Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. For you are God sovereign in all your ways. Our lives and our times are in your hands. Thank you for you are molding us. You are, you are shaping us into your purposes, oh God. Lord, as we come to your word this morning, Lord, I ask that you speak to us by your spirit. Would you bring life? Would you bring insight? Would you bring understanding? Would you bring comfort in the name of Jesus? So we're saying that adventures of faith requires faith for advance. And the faith that perseveres with courage to apprehend promises God has made. And last Sunday I shared to you that any man, any person who is on a disadventure the ultimate is that they leave a legacy of faith when they are done. So today I'm going to speak to you about the power of sight in the adventure of faith. Anybody use glasses here? I use glasses. Now when I remove my glasses, all of you are like shadows. <laughs> and I can't read my Bible but I put this on, it becomes clear. I see all the makeups and all the foundations and all the. <laughs> you see what this little thing can do? Glasses. So sight is powerful. In our walk of faith, in the adventure of faith, sometimes we walk through terrains that we don't know. We walk through uneven surfaces. We walk through sometimes what look like shadows that you really can't feel your way in. Sometimes the road is so uncertain you don't know what is going to happen. You require, when you can't see where you're going, you don't know what's around the corner, you require a kind of sight to keep advancing in those moments. That's what I'm talking about. There is a side that you need to keep going when things don't make sense. There is a side that, that keeps your feet steady where you're not sure where you're going. When God said to Abraham, leave your house, your father's house, to a land that I will show you, he packs his luggage into his boots. And the wife says, you know, what's the postcode where I'm going? I said, I don't know. 
It requires a kind of sight to keep going, not knowing where you're going. That's what we're talking about. That sight is powerful when it comes to faith. That's why Hebrews 11.1, one, a key verse on faith, say, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of sin, not sin. How can you be convinced of what you don't see? It turns out there is a sight that helps you see what you cannot see with your eyes. It requires a, an assurance, a conviction, if you're willing to go on adventure of faith. And we said last time that those who do that, they are able to defy obstacles, defy the status quo, and go on to apprehend what God has, has for them. But to do so, you must be convinced of things you cannot see. You say, oh, faith is the conviction of things not seen. Now, I, I want to I challenge you today that being a Christian is not just, uh, you know, that saying, I'm born again, and then you, uh, you go to church and sing songs. No. It's about living a life that is extraordinary. A life that doesn't make sense to the ordinary person. That's what it is. And that life requires you to walk by faith. So when I talk about the power of sight in this work, sight refers to the power or the faculty of seeing. You know, it is the perception or the interpretation, how we interpret objects that we see with our eyes. You know, your sight includes your range of vision, your or mental perception. If you know, if you've been to the, um, somebody looking at your eyes, and if you put one, say, how many, how many fingers is it? Say, is, is it two? Okay. That's, you can identify, is it two or one? And then you do that. Like, if I move here, can you see? If I move here, can you see? It? What if I'm moving like this? Are you able to see all of them? Those things are important because if your sight is impaired, you won't be able to track. That's why a car is passing. You will see the car. You will just bang into the car. Sight is important. Sight is important because without sight, you are limited. I've just told you, if I remove my glasses now, I'll struggle. I may not be able to recognize you. Your advance in life is compromised when your sight is impaired. When you can't see, you can't advance well. That's why we use the aids of glasses. So in the same way, when your spiritual eyes is, is compromised, you're limited. So your spiritual eyes is crucial in the adventure of faith. Your sight affects your faith. Your faith can only rise to the extent you can see in the spirit. If, you, if you're blind in the spirit, you don't have faith because you make decisions of what you can see. And a lot of times, we all suffer myopia. We are all short-sighted. Two weeks ago, when Leo preached on, on, on Caleb, in, in Numbers 13, verse 33, see what, they, see what they, they, those spies said. There we saw the Nephilim. The Anakims came from the Nephilim. And to ourselves, we seemed like grasshoppers. And so we seemed to them. Did you see that? Could you imagine this? You saw somebody, and then you decided that, that you are like a grasshopper because they are so tall. And also, they see you like grasshoppers. Not only that you see yourself as grasshopper, but you have interpreted that that's the, how they see you. The difference between Caleb and Joshua and the other ten spies was their sight. Did you realize that? Caleb and Joshua said, shh. You see giants, all I see is bread and butter. You see giants, all I see are people God has cut down. 
Say, their defenses are cut off. Come on, let's go and take the land. Their sight was the difference. I think the other, other ten spies should have gone to expect savers. A lot of times when you don't see, you forfeit a future God has for you. That happened to the Israelites. The, those spies, they went, they saw the good land. They said, it's a good land. I'm, I'm not, we're not agreeing about that. But the issue is that there are giants. And they can't see beyond the giant to the God who gave them the land. They can't see beyond the giant to the God who created the giants. There is a sight you need to be able to go into what God has for you. Your sight is so powerful because it influences your faith. That's my first point today. That your sight influences your faith. The power of sight lies in its ability to influence our feelings and our faith. When you, the way you feel affects affect whether your faith will rise or fall. Something happened um, in, um, Jesus was with the disciples and they finished feeding the 5,000. And he sent them away, he went to pray. He finished praying and, uh, praying and then he came back going to them. It was late. He was walking on water. And they saw him and said, he's a ghost. No, he said, don't, guys, calm down. It's not a ghost. It's me. He does say, he want to, to prove that it's you, he would ask me to come to the water. Could you imagine that? And Jesus said, come. And look at Matthew 20, 14, verse 28. Say, Peter answered, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. That's bold. You know what it means to walk on water? If you did physics. There's something called Archimedes principles or the principles of flotation. Now you have to define these principles for you to walk on water. He said, he said, okay, come. And so Peter got out of the boat. Did you get that? The boat was in water was he stepped out. Not on concrete, but on water. The feet didn't sink. He brought out the other leg, it didn't sink. And he began to walk. So, whoa! <laughs> we are cool here now. I'm walking on water. He told, the, he told uh, Andrew and the other guys, you guys are a little faith. I'm walking on water. <laughs> and then, as I was walking towards Jesus, he looked around, and the wave was doing like this. Look at what he said here. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out. I was saying that your sight affects your feelings, affect your faith. The moment he focused on the waves, he began, fear set in. And when fear sets in, faith walks out. And he begins to sink. What you see is important. That's the message I want to bring to you today. That when things are in front of you, if you only see what your eyes can see, something is wrong. You're not walking, you're not, you're, you're not living by the Spirit. Those who live by the Spirit, they see beyond what their glasses can help them to see. In 2 Kings chapter 6, the story of Elisha with his servant. Elisha was uh, the pro a prophet in, his, in Israel. Well known. This Elisha was, it was a terror to the Syrians because the king of Syria, they will, they will stay in there, they will call, um, what's this thing they call? Uh, uh, they call a cobra meeting. They call a cobra meeting and then, uh, and then Elijah, Elisha will call the king of Israel, said, uh, they said they had a cobra meeting today and this is what they discussed in the meeting. Here's their strategy and it will foil all their plans. It happened over and over and over. Then the king of Israel said, come, who among you is a spy for the king, for the king of Israel? And one guy who, they said, look, <laughs> said, say, 
Look, there's nobody, say, nobody is spying for Israel here. But they have a man who sees. They have a prophet. Whatever you even, even the things you say to your wife in your bedroom, he knows about it and he tells the king. And he said, okay, go, go and catch him. So they dispatched an army, a whole army, to go and arrest one, one, man, one man. And Elisha wasn't a, he wasn't a big guy. And so in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15, say so when they woke up in the morning, the servant looked around, an attendant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out. An army with horses and chiros all around the city. The servant said, alas, master, we are done. What shall we do? He replied. He said, do not be afraid, for there are more with us than there are with them. There are more with us than uh, there, there are with them. And Elisha was not just saying what. He saw that there are more with him. And what did he do? He said, he said Lord. So Elijah prayed, said, oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. The same guy that saw Shiros, saw Ami, Elisha is saying that he wasn't seeing. That there means there's another level of seeing that, that we need. If you're not going to be controlled by what is happening around you, by situations of life, by the um, uh, interest rate rises, by uh, energy bill rises, by cost of living crisis, if you're not going to be controlled by that, you have to have another sight. He said, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And so, the Lord opened his, the eyes of the servant, and he saw the mountains was full of horses and chiros of fire all around Elisha. Did you see that? Those chiros of fire, those horses, they were there all the time. Elisha saw it, but the servant didn't see it. It requires an opening of his eyes for him to see it. it do you know that the, the, those moments when you are afraid, when you think you are done, that there are armies of heaven defending you that you don't know about, or if only your eyes will be open to see them, then you will not be afraid. What I'm saying to you today that we, we need our eyes to be open that we will we'll see what God has provided for us. So that we will not be ruled by what our eyes are telling you. Your eyes can, cannot be trusted because it's limited on what it can see. As a child of God, we walk by faith and not by sight. To walk by faith, you have to have an eyes of your own, an eyes, an inner eyes opened so you can see beyond what your eyes can see. Um, I, I watch wrestling. And one of my favorite you know, WWE stars is John, John Cena. Say, you can't see me. <laughs> That's it. Say, you can't see me. <laughs> what he's saying, like, look, you know, you, before you know it, I've got you. A lot of times you can't see. You may go to the uh, uh, spec server and spend, uh, uh, my wife spends hundreds of pounds on her glasses. <laughs> I don't get it. And yet, you can't see. <laughs> there, is, there is a scene that you don't need to go to spec savers. There is a scene spec savers cannot give you. There's a scene your glasses cannot give you. There's a scene your 2020 vision cannot give you. There is a scene that comes from the spirit. That scene is what sets you apart. When you see that way, you see the possibilities God has for you. What you see has tremendous influence on your faith, more than you ever think or realize or even acknowledge. 
what you see fits your faith or feeds your fears. To advance in faith, to take mountains, to obtain promises, to leave a legacy of faith for your children, you need a sight that feeds your faith. Somebody didn't hear me. I'm saying that for you to advance in faith, for you to uh, apprehend what God has for you, for you to leave a legacy of faith for your children, you need a sight that feeds your faith, not your fears. The sight that feeds your faith requires you to have a clear vision. I'm not talking about your eyes now. A clear vision that distinguish between facts and truth. You know there's a, a difference between facts and truth? Okay. Elisha saw these armies. Elisha's servant saw these armies. That was a fact. It is a fact that the interest rate has risen. It is a fact that the energy bill has risen. Those are facts. But the truth is that there are other armies bigger than the one he saw. That's the truth. There is a side that helps to this clear vision helps to distinguish between facts and truth. And that comes from God. That's why Elisha prayed, oh Lord, open his eyes that he may see. I pray that somebody will make that their prayer today. Say, Lord, open my eyes to see. So if you're going to have that sight that fits your faith, you have to have a clear vision. Second, you need to see with the eyes of the Spirit. You have physical lenses. That's your eyes. But also have spiritual lenses. That's your spiritual eyes. The lens you, you, you use determines what you see. Elisha's servant was using his uh, spec saver prescribed glasses and he saw Syrian armies. And when you use your spec saver glasses, I'm going to ask them to pay me today. When you use your gla- or, or vision expert, whichever one you use, or Tesco, whichever one you use, when you use that, you always see depression. You see cost, cost of living rises. You see brokenness. You see hopelessness. But when you use your spiritual lenses, that you see there's a God who controls the fears of men. Who, who is not um, controlled by the economy of any nation. Who rules in our lives. We need to see with the eyes of the Spirit if you're going to feed your faith. Totally also we need to correct our focus. Correct our focus. The Elisha servant was focused on those Syrian armies. Elijah, Elijah prayed, open his eyes. He just correct his focus. His focus was just changed and he, he saw differently. He saw differently. At the moment he saw those chiros, bigger, mightier, stronger army, fear disappeared because he's seen clearly. Jesus was speaking to the Laodicean churches. In Revelation chapter 3. I just read verse 18. It said, therefore, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. And white robes to clothe you to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen. And serve to anoint your eyes that you may see. These are metaphors. But it's saying that the things you have, you, this clothes doesn't cover. Your bank account is not strong enough to support your, 
your, your expenses. Your glasses you're wearing is not enough for you to see. If you say, if you want to see clearly, come to me and I will correct your focus. If you want to be rich, true rich is not in your balance or your bank account. It's in the treasures you have in me. Your sight is powerful because it influences your faith. Secondly, it changes your perspectives. What you see changes your perspective. Your perspective is the ability to see all the relevant data in meaningful relationship. Let me explain that. You know, perspective when you, you, there are so many data around. You gather all the data. When you gather the data, um, uh, you know, the interest rate rise and uh, energy, energy rise and um, uh, how, you know, housing costs rise, your uh, mortgage rises and uh, rent rises and these are data. But perspective is to when you get all the data and put them in meaningful relationship, how they relate with each other and to the greater agenda. We're saying that your sight helps you to get a better perspective. That means that you are able to put things and relate them well. When you relate them wrongly, you make wrong conclusions. And you make wrong choices. You move where you're not supposed to move. Somebody doesn't understand what I'm saying. You're, when you have a clear sight, you get a better perspective. Your perspective will influence your choices, influence your decisions. Perspectives is what you need most of the time. Caleb saw beyond the giants. He saw a God who is bigger than the giants. He saw a God who is faithful, who has promised, I will give you this land. Say, this God is able to give me this land. Because I know him that if he made a promise, giants cannot stop from fulfilling his promise. Did that make sense? If I made a promise to you, if I say something in his word, it's not dependent on you. Those promises is, is tied to his name. He's exalted his word above everything else. Caleb saw that, but the other spies didn't see that. They, they got the data, but they didn't put them in proper, in proper relationship. In Genesis chapter, that was read to you earlier, Genesis chapter 13. I don't know if you know what happened there. Lord has, um, Abraham, when God told him to go on this journey you know, without a postcode, he moved and he took Lord with him. And they grew, God blessed them, and then they began to have strife. Uh, Abraham, Abraham said, look, look, let's not be strife between us. Let, let's separate. He said, Lord, you choose. And Lord looked around. I see the, the sight here now. He looked around and saw the Negev, lush, green, vegetations. He said, wow, are you sure I should choose first? I'm just checking, just say this lush, green area. Say, well, if you say I should choose first, I'm going this way. He saw with the eyes. He chose by the eyes. When you choose what your natural eyes, you're going to make mistake. A lot of people have chosen, chose, have chose a wrong husband by, with their natural eyes. They chose a wrong wife with natural eyes. Chose a wrong job with their natural eyes. I can go on. So when Lot has departed, God says to Abraham, after Lot had separated from him, say, rise, raise your eyes. I, I, I stopped here when I read this. Say, raise your eyes. He had eyes, but the eyes was down. He said, raise your eyes. Because what has happened there, Lot has gone, apparently chose the best part of the land. And he was down. Say, what have I done? Have I made a mistake? What is silly me? And he was like living in regret. And God said, come on, raise your eyes. He said, look. 
In a lot of times when we're in problem, when we, our head is down, and all you say, you, you focus your eyes on the problem. You bury yourself on it, mate. And that's all you say. And so long as you focus on your problem, you don't see God. He said, raise your eyes and look. From the place where you are, look north, look south, look east, look west. As far as you can see, I will give to you. Amazing. Say, all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offering forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also will be counted. He said, rise up. First of all, say, raise your eyes. Now get up. It's yours. Walk through it. If you can't see it, you can't walk into it. You cannot possess what you cannot see. Your sight persists your experience. Your sight persists your possession. You have to see it before you can possess it. You have to see, see it before you can experience it. You cannot Im- explain what you cannot imagine. Your advance will be determined by what you're willing to see. And what you see influences your perspective of things around you. To have a better perspective, you must see possibilities beyond the immediate. Abraham was, it's like he's taking the best part of the land. I'm done. But God say, raise your eyes, look up. That I don't know what, what, whatever it is, maybe your maybe real problems or apparent problems, real loss or apparent loss. Failures and delays and disappointments. That you, for you need a perspective to be able to see possibilities beyond the immediate. The loss of a lost a loved one. To see God beyond that. If you don't see God beyond that, you bury yourself in sorrow all your life. A lot of people have lost somebody dead to them and then their life stopped because they couldn't see beyond the loss. God came to Abraham and said, Abraham, look up. You look, it looks like you've lost this a lush vegetation, but they look, there's something better for than this. When you miss that bus that you're trying to catch or miss that train, there's something better than that one that is coming on your way. When you miss that house you wanted to buy, there's a better house coming your way. When you miss that uh, wife you wanted to marry, there's a better wife coming your way. You miss that husband, there's a better husband coming your way. There's something better God has in front of you. You have to be able to see perspective beyond the immediate. In Romans 8, 28, say, for we know, we are certain, we are convinced, we are persuaded that for those who love God, all things work together for good. He said, we are certain of this. The question you need to ask yourself, do, do I love God? If you love God, even this loss will work out for my good. Even this loss of a job will work out for my good. Even this pain right now will work out for my good. Do I love God? I know I love God. Because I love God, I know that this also will work out for my good. So to get a better person, you have to see possibilities beyond the image, but also you have to change your posture. God told Abraham, look up. What he's saying to you, if you want to get a better person, you have to change your posture. Stop looking down, look up. Stop focusing on your problems, look up. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying right now? God is saying to you, look up. Until you look up, you will see a better perspective. If your face is down, you can only see around you and you'll be stuck. 
your thinking will, 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 will rot because it's just going around in circles. You have to change your posture. Your posture limits your vision. When you're sitting down here, you can't see beyond, I don't know, uh, been to parties, particularly African parties, and where there's some women tie this kind of um, hair tie. Uh, am I lost? <laughs> there's this thing the women tie, they call it the uh, gele. So they can be as tall as Kilimanjaro. <laughs> and if you're in a, in a function, and one is sitting in front of you, you're done. Even if you're six foot seven. I mean, even if you're six foot seven, you can't see because it's going to blow. So if you want to see what's happening in front, change your posture. You have to do this. If you want to get a good, a good camera shot, you have to do this. Okay. God said to Abraham, change your posture. You're looking down too much. Get up. Look up. But also you need to change your position. He said, rise up. Where you are determines what you see and who sees you. Somebody, somebody needs to hear this today. Where you are determines what you see and who sees you. And the guy, the man, the woman, God has assigned to bless you. Just needs to see you. But he can't see you because of where you are. I pray that God will give us discernment to understand the importance of our position. If you want to be aligned to God's purpose, you need to change your position. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 5 to 6, time has passed after God made promise to Abraham. And God comes to him, I said, to, he said come to Abraham. He met him in the heart. He said, he brought him outside and said, look towards the heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, so shall your descendant be. And he believed the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Why did he have to bring him out of the hut? Because the hut is confined. You can't see. It's, your vision is limited. God needs to bring him out. He has to change his position so he can see. If you want to get a better perspective, I'd like you to change your position. Some of the times, the, the company you keep is a wrong position to be. And all you hear is negative things. All you hear is condemning things. Or don't, don't hang out with people that put you down. Don't hang out with people that drain your faith, that, that, that feed your fears. When somebody is only feeding your fear, that's not a good place to be. So having a right perspective is crucial for the adventures of faith. Because what you see helps to shape and change your perspective. Your posture is the way you look. Your position is the, your standpoint. And that is very, very crucial for your sight. Until your perspective change, you may not be able to advance into what God has prepared for you. So I'm saying that sight is important. Sight is powerful because it deflects your faith and changes your perspective. Finally, your sight brings hope alive. Your sight brings hope alive. We go back to Hebrews 11. 1. He said, now faith is the assurance of things to hope for. Now, say faith is the assurance of things hoped for. So, since faith is the assurance of hope, that means without hope, that faith doesn't exist. Is my deductions right? So that means hope is crucial to life. It's crucial to the adventure of faith. To walk in faith, you have to keep hope alive. Sight is so powerful in adventure of faith because what you see affects hope. You say, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. When you're not seeing well, Hope will die. When you see the wrong things, you lose hope. People commit suicide because they, they've lost hope, because they can't see beyond their problem. They can't see beyond the pile of debt. 
They can't see beyond the pain they're going through right now. And so they make a, a wrong decision because hope dies when you can't see well. Jeremiah, I'm just going to hold in you know, you know, you know, on this and, cl and close here. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 11 to 12. Jeremiah 1, 11 to 12. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? Hear this. God comes to Jeremiah and says, what do you see? And I believe God is asking you today, all of us seated here, what do you see? And, he, and I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I'm watching over my word to perform it. I want, somebody to, I want everyone to hear me clearly here. I believe God wants to say something to you. God is saying, what do you see? God said to Jeremiah, what do you see? Jeremiah said, I see an almond tree. I see an almond branch. I said, well, if you're seeing an almond, you're seeing well. If you see an almond, you're seeing well. Why? I said, why almond? The almond, the uh, amygdalus uh, cuminus, that's the Hebrew word shoki, shakid. Shakid means the awakening one. Jeremiah said, I see an almond. That means I see Shakid. I see the awakening one. And God said, you've seen well. The almond is the first tree to awake from the sleep of winter. It is the first to blossom, you know, blossom in the spring. It, it, it blossoms before the leaves come out. Almonds, are, they are very highly, you know, highly prized. And to be honest, I like almonds a lot. It's one snack I will not say no to. Um, if, if, if uh, put almond, almond, almond ones, particularly if it's a, if it's a you know, um, a roasted, um, but I don't, I don't like salt in it. A roasted, if you put it, if you put poison in it, I might likely be poisoned because I'm going to eat it. <laughs> Almonds are, you know, it's very, and very, very rich. It's highly priced. But almonds speaks of the end of winter of life. It announces the spring. Almond speaks of hope. That's what God told to Jeremiah. What do you see? He said, I see an almond tree. He said, if you're seeing the almond, you've seen well. God said, says to him, you have seen well because I am, I am shokid. That's a play of word here. Shokid means I'm a wakeful to my word. Jeremiah said, I see the almond, shakid. God said to him, I am shaky. That means I am awakeful to my word. Jeremiah said, I see, I see the awakening ones. You see well because I'm watching over my word to perform it. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying here? God is, the almond signifies God's wakefulness. God's alertness. At a time when the people were unfaithful, God said, I'm awake. When you're sleeping and slumbering, when there's no hope, when the economy is crumbling, God said, I'm awake. I'm awake. The almond speaks of hope. God is saying in the midst of hopelessness, I'm awake. When there was a contention, Israel were uh, contending with uh, Moses and who, is, who has God chosen. He told them to bring rods. In number 17, they bring rods. All the 12 tribes bring rods. Dry rods. He put it in the temple. And they went home. The following day they came, Aaron's rod bought them. What did he bring, bring forth? Almonds. What does almond mean? He said God's commitment and faithfulness to the tribe of Levi and to Aaron. Ammon shows God's faithfulness. He said, God saying that as long as life remains, I am committed to the tribe of Levi that will preach to me. The Ammon speaks of God's word, the past. It speaks of God's work, the present. It speaks of God's way, the future. The Ammon speaks of hope. It all says, says to us to forget the former things, to forget the past things, for God is doing a new thing a present work, and to look forward with, for a brighter future because God is watching over his word to perform it. God wants us to judge our lives, to judge our lives by his faithfulness, not by the things around us, by his never-ending commitment to us, by his watchfulness to perform his word. 
That's why uh, Isaiah 55, verse 8 to 12. Let me read it quickly. Because I'm not going to explain it. I just want, it, I want the word to speak over you. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my, your, your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your, your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return, but water the earth, making it bring forth sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I propose and pro succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Say, for you shall go out in joy and be left forth in, in peace. The mountains and the hills, the mountain speaks of powerful governments, He'll speak of in smaller governments, say the mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing. The authorities and principalities and powers before you, they shall break forth into singing. And the trees, three speaks of powerful men and, of, of the earth, say they shall, shall clap their hands for you. God is saying that I am my word over you will precede governments, will precede people, precede what men say about you. They may try to put you down, but what my word says will stand over your life. My counsel for your life will stand. My purposes will come to pass. For, for I am God, Isaiah 46, 9 11, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no like me, declaring the end from the beginning. From the ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel will stand. I will accomplish my purpose. I have spoken, I will bring it to pass. I have proposed, and I will do it. God wants you to be assured of this, to see the armored branch, to see the awakening one, because it reminds us that whatever deal God has made with you is still on. Time will not change it. Circumstances will not change it. Economy will not change. Whatever promise, whatever day is made with you, that day is still on. If you can see the almond branch, when you look at the situations around you, if you can see the almond branch, you're seeing well. You will have hope and you will finish strong. So look beyond whatever failures or successes or pain or disappointment are going through right now. Look to what the Lord has said because he's watching over his word to accomplish it. Hope comes alive when you see beyond your challenges, when you see the awakening ones, and when you trust God to perform his word. I close with this. Hebrews 11 was saying, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, a conviction of things not seen. You don't have to say it with your eyes, but you can see it with your spiritual eyes. To, to be certain of what your eyes cannot see requires another level of seeing. I've said that sight is vital for faith adventure because your sight influences your faith, changes your perspectives, and brings hope alive. So I want us to pray the prayer of Elijah, Elijah today. Say, Lord, please open our eyes to see. Can we just now bow our heads down, everyone?